You know, I've been deaf for about 13 years now. And thinking back to then, I was driving a tank truck and I got in a fire with it. I found myself in the hospital in order to save my life. They gave me real heavy dosage of drugs, including streptomycin and other myosins. And the first thing we knew, I'd lost my hearing. And eventually I got out of the hospital. And of course, I was just totally deaf at that time and I was looking for help. And it didn't look like there was much insight. However, finally, I heard that there was a possibility of a cochlear implant that was being developed. And over more than 10 years, I was communicating with Dr. William House. And during that time, of course, I was completely dependent upon lip reading and strictly silence. And finally, last April, we not only had the installation of the implant that was working, but then we finally hooked up electronics that I could carry home with me and pick up sound. And of course, from that time on, I could hear the dog bark or of course hear a person talk to me. And one of the very Charles Grazer, going out the age backyard. 44. And Occupation, like former history that. teacher with limited rehabilitation as a school way. librarian. Said, well, a Diagnosis? Ototoxic hearing loss with no audiometric responses. Treatment, sound, course, the electronic through. cochlea. exciting even to just hear a bell ring when I'm working or to hear the telephone here at home or to be home all alone and hear the doorbell ring and be able to go up and let a friend in and then have a successful conversation with them. There's just sound after sound that you could enumerate that I hear now, whether it's walking and stepping on a piece of gravel that grates, or whether it's a twig out in the forest, whether you walk by a stream and hear the water flowing, a wave breaking when you're by the ocean, all kinds of sound. You've just been listening to the voice of Mr. Charles Grazer, a man totally deafened by streptomycin for more than 10 years. For the past three years, Jack Urban, a very innovative electrical engineer, and I have been working intensively with Mr. Grazer. We implanted a device into his inner ear, an electrode system, that allowed us to pass minute electrical currents into his inner ear and thus stimulate a sensation of sound. For the first two years, we studied the best type of electrical currents that would give Mr. Grazer the most meaning of sound. And during the past one year, he has had a wearable device that transmits the sound of his environment, speech and surrounding sounds, into an electrical impulse which is passed into his electrode implant. And in this way, he has had contact with his sound environment. Let me explain the principles of this device to you. Now, this is a regular diagram of the ear, and to review, the sound comes in through the external auditory canal, moves the eardrum and ossicles. This sound is then transmitted into a fluid wave, which stimulates the sensory cells of the inner ear called the hair cells. These cells, in some way, then create a nerve impulse an electrical impulse which is carried along the hearing nerve to the brain where it's interpreted as meaningful sound. Now any 
defect in the hearing mechanism in the external ear or middle ear is called conductive loss. And any defect in the inner ear or the hearing nerve is called sensory neural loss. Now, if we take a cross section of the basal coil, we see that we have here the scala tympani, the scala media, and the scala vestibuli. Now, the hair cells, which are on the basilar membrane, actually are vibrated by the fluid movements of the inner ear, and these hair cells then stimulate the hearing nerve, which is shown in black. Now, if an individual is missing the hearing nerve, we call this neural deafness. On the other hand, if the nerve fiber is present, but the hair cells are missing, we call this sensory deafness. Now, it is the sensory deafened patient who can be helped by means of a cochlear implant. And we know that some patients have pure sensory deafness because, for example, in animals who have been given streptomycin, we see that there is a loss of hair cells, but that the nerve endings remain viable. Now, here's a cross-section of a slide taken from the collection at the Los Angeles Foundation of Otology of a patient who had streptomycin deafness. Now, this patient's inner ear shows loss of hair cells, but the nerve endings themselves are quite viable and appear in very good shape. Now, this would then would be an example of pure sensory deafness. Now, we know that any nerve in the body can be stimulated electrically and that the interpretation that the individual makes of that stimulus will depend upon the nerve which is stimulated. For example, if I stimulate a nerve in my arm, even though my eyes are closed, I would perceive a sensation of pain and I know it was coming from my arm. If I stimulate electrically close to the eye, I would see a flash of light. Or if we stimulate by placing a current close to the inner ear, then we would have a sensation of sound. Now, the principle of this particular device, the cochlear implant, is that we place a wire into the scala tympani. We call this the active electrode. We then place a ground wire uh, somewhere else, usually in the temporal muscle or somewhere else in the body. Then when we apply an electric current to this system, a field is generated so that the electrical field stimulates the endings of the hearing nerve, the eighth nerve, and thus the patient experiences a sensation of sound. Now the whole concept here is that if we can apply complex enough electric signals, then the individual could have meaning from this sound. Now, I became interested in this problem some oh, 15 years ago in 1957, when a patient brought to me a newspaper clipping about some work that was being done in Paris by DiGiorno and Ayers. They had implanted a wire into the inner ear of a patient who was totally deaf because he had lost both cochleas through the invasion of cholesteatoma. This patient experienced very worthwhile sound and felt that the device was quite worthwhile to him. Now, fortunately, a very grateful patient, Mr. George Eccles, gave the Los Angeles Foundation of Otology a grant so that I could work on this project. Some four years later, I implanted a wire, an electrode, into the inner ear of a patient. And we were elated to find that he could actually hear sounds with this and that he seemed to feel that these sounds were very worthwhile to him. We were obviously extremely disappointed when a few weeks later, he developed an allergic reaction to the insulating material of this implant, and it had to be removed. And in addition, another very unfortunate thing happened in that the engineer with whom I was working at that time released this information to the press, and we were deluged with patients who wanted to have some type of similar device so that they too could hear. We, however, remained very interested in this project, and during the 60s, a number of things happened which were very favorable to this entire concept. One of them, of course, was that it was found that in animals, 
wires could be placed through brain tissue into various parts of the brain. These electrodes were tolerated for long periods of time without reaction. And then also wires were placed into the cochlea on a number of animals, and these were tolerated for long periods of time. Also, there were a number of, of advances in the field of electronics due to the stimulus of the moonshots. So that some three years ago, Jack Irvin and I felt we were ready to again implant several patients. Now, we selected three patients. Two of these patients were totally deafened as a result of streptomycin, and one patient was deaf because of advanced syphilis. Now, the way we selected these patients was to apply an electrode under local anesthesia to the promontory. Now, this diagrams the placement of the electrode between the oval and the round window. And we found that when we would apply an electric current to the promontory, and this current was then transmitted to the ground electrode in the temporal muscle, that if we would apply a square wave current of between 30 cycles and 120 cycles, and if this current was of a magnitude of three-tenths of a volt to one and a half volts, at which time it became painful, that the patient would perceive a sensation of sound. Now, each of these patients responded in this way to this type of electrical stimulus. Now, it's very interesting that normal patients with hair cells do not respond in this way. Once we had selected these patients then, we implanted a device into the inner ear, and the, the general concept of this device is shown here. Now, what we did was to place a screw into the mastoid tip, a stud, to which we could, could attach a button. Now, this button had openings in it that we could plug in wires, and each of these uh, plugs then connected to a wire extending into the inner ear. Now, the button has six wire connections, and five of these wires are passed down through the mastoid, through the facial recess, through the round window, and into the scala tympani. Now, we found on cadaver dissections that we could pass this electrode system around the scala tympani about 20 millimeters without damage to the basilar membrane and thus damage to the nerve endings of the eighth nerve. So we then decided to put five electrodes into this area, and they are illustrated here with the electrode first being just inside the round window, then another one four millimeters beyond that, and four millimeters and so on, so that we had five electrodes placed into the scala tympani, and then we had a sixth wire placed as a ground wire into the oval window. Now we subsequently found that the ground was better placed elsewhere, either in the, in the temporal muscle or elsewhere on the body. Now, the reason for this electrode system and the use of a button, we recognized that the button was not a stable situation as long as it came out through the skin, was that we felt it very important that we be able to pass very complex circuits of all different types into the inner ear and that we'd be able to know exactly what circuit was going to what part of the inner ear and then get the feedback from the patient as to how this created a sensation of sound for him. Now, we then worked for a period of some time with this device, and I want to show you, however, the actual placement of the device in surgery. <laughs> 